unemployment is an unspent income story. And if you have a trade partner in the world economy, which has lots of unspent income, so you export a lot, but you don't spend those export earnings in the world economy, that means you have a, have a lack of demand. And that means you will have significant unemployment in the world economy. If you look at the real economy, you would say, well, the US got the better deal. They sent these little green pieces of paper abroad to China, and the Chinese supplied them with lots of stuff for Walmart and for other consumption outlets. Of course, you, you could say from an MMT perspective, the collapse in employment in some of the areas that were hardest hit in the US, you could have used deficit spending by the government to create new jobs. It's a combination of, of an unspent income story and a deficit spending story. Any amount of unspent income you could tolerate as long as there's deficit spending going on to compensate for that. That would have been possible, but it wasn't done. This is the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Hi, I'm Christian Riley, and welcome to the Modern Monetary Theory Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at MMT Podcast, and you can support the show by going to patreon.com slash MMT Podcast. For as little as a dollar a month, you can get early access to all our episodes and patron-only episodes. A big thank you to all our supporters so far. At the beginning there, you heard economist and author Dr. Dirk Entz. And in a moment, we're going to be talking to Dirk about central banking, international trade, China's new digital currency, and most excitingly, the second international European MMT conference, which is coming up in September 2021. If this is your first time hearing about MMT, you might want to listen to our first three episodes for an easy introduction. But if you want to dive in here, if you live in a country where everybody uses a fiat currency, like say the UK, the US, Japan, Canada or Australia, and you've ever wondered what that means, it means that the currency you use is issued and it's issued by your government and it's literally spent into existence. This means that your government spending is not revenue constrained, which helps us think differently about our nation real policy options. For example, maybe governments that spend money into existence shouldn't be worrying about instantly and unconditionally waiving so-called rights to so-called intellectual property in order to prevent mass suffering and death globally, in the same way that they never worry about where the money's coming from when they fund things that cause mass suffering and death globally. It's kind of a no-brainer to everybody except Bill Gates. Anyway, I've linked to all the relevant stuff in the show notes, including the website of the MMT conference. And as ever, I've linked to where you can support this podcast financially via patreon.com slash MMT podcast. Support starts at a dollar a month, which is 71 British pence at the time of recording. And no matter what level of support you give, you get early access to all of our episodes and patron only episodes where you can ask me and Patricia MMT questions. We're 100% listener funded. Your financial support really helps keep the show going and your support in other ways, whether it's by recommending us to other people or just by listening and spreading the word about this stuff really helps too. So thanks for the time you put into understanding MMT. Let's dive in. Welcome one and all to the MMT podcast. I'm Christian Riley. And I'm Patricia Pino. And we're delighted to welcome back to the MMT podcast, economist, author, and friend of the show, Dr. Dirk Entz. Dirk, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me, Chris and Patricia. So, Dirk, we wanted to talk about the recent news that China is launching a digital currency. But first, we wanted to set the scene. and We're always looking for new ways to talk about and explain endogenous money. So could you say it your way? Well, the way that I explain it is normally if you are looking at a bank which is extending a loan, it is, it is basically buying um, your, your payment of the loan. So you can, you can really interpret the, a loan as a sale of a promise to pay by the borrower. So if I go to the bank and I say, I'll, I like to have a hundred thousand euros. Um, and then the bank says, okay, um, how many euros will you pay for that? And then you say, well, with an interest rate of 5%, I will pay you in one year, 105,000 euros. And then what the bank is really doing when it's, when it is extending a loan is that they buy my, my promise to pay with their promise to pay. So the the bank deposits that they are they are creating, they are really promises to pay. 
What are they going to pay me? Well, they, they could pay me cash if I demand it, so I can go to the bank, use the ATM, and get my, my 100,000 euros. Uh, shouldn't really do that, <laughs> but that I could. Um, and the other idea, of course, is that I can make a payment. So the bank uh, executes a payment for me that I pay something with my bank deposits, which are worth 100,000 euros. So that's that's how the endogenous money approach works. And, and as you can see, there's there's no reliance on uh, outside savings or reserves or, or anything else. So what banks are, are really doing there, they are engaging in credit analysis, which is they are, they are checking whether the, the borrower will be able to repay. If it's a household, they check mostly for income, um, but also for collateral. And if it's a, it's a company, they, they pretty much prefer collateral because income might be shaky. Great. That, that's really nice and concise. Um, and I, I just wanted to check out whether you thought this was a valid way to say it. Warren will say, and it's beyond dispute, banks are government agents. Commercial banks are government agents. So I like to think of it as that it's the government lending money into existence through its agent. So, you know, how we say that the MMT is say that when the government votes on spending, it's voted that money into existence and it spends that money into existence. The government also has this policy that allows people to have money lent into existence. Does that sound okay or is it too much of an oversimplification? No, I think that's correct. Um, I mean, that's the, the the payment part. So again, the bank deposits are, are promises of payment. And how do you pay as a bank? Well, you need cash. But if you want cash, you need to be uh, uh, linked up with your local central bank or your national central bank so, so that you have an account there and they will come and deliver cash to you uh, and your bank. Um, and the other way to pay is, is by, by shifting around uh, to reserves. So you need to have access again to the central bank's uh, payment system. So this is why the banks are, are basically agents of the state when they, when they a- engage in uh, lending, but also in, in making payments and, and distributing cash. So I, I think that Warren is, is completely correct there, that banks are not, even though they are run privately and for profit, they, they are still agents of the state. And the state can can always change regulation and change the way that that banks are working. For example, um, I guess just out of curiosity, why is this important? Uh, in in the sense of what 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 have mainstream economies been getting wrong about money creation, and wh- wh- why does it matter that banks create money in this way? Well, the the mainstream story is is very simple. They they imagine a world where we are all small scale farmers, so everybody's. Uh, in the backyard farming stuff. So um, if you want to consume something, we need to produce it. Okay, so if you eat, want to eat some corn, you need to grow some corn first. Um, and if you want to save some corn, you need to grow it first too. Um, and if you want to lend some corn, well, then you have to grow it and then you lend it out. And this is why in the neoclassical theory, they they are correct in their own world. Um, so in, in this kind of uh, world without money, um, where you just swap uh, real goods and services like like corn, then it's correct to say that that saving comes first, and then you can can invest those savings. Um, so the problem, of course, is that our our modern economies uh, do not resemble these barter economies that you can see in in the textbooks. Um, so if I want to invest some some money, I go to a bank and they give me a loan. So nobody needs to save anything before I can get a loan. So money is created when when the banks are extending loans, and that of course um, is is a completely different story. Um, so that is why I would say that in the modern world you should base your your theory on a monetary theory of production, as Keynes called it, and MMT is just the theory that delivers this kind of of idea. Perfect. So. Uh- also, me and Patricia were talking recently, and uh, Patricia is now moving into in academic circles. And uh, she mentioned that there's a there's been a discussion, possibly long running discussion, about the merits of the German banking system with more co ops and public banks, as I understand it, versus the way other countries do it. Uh, could you talk about that? Yeah, the the German banking system is is different from from those of other countries. Um, we have more public banks, so roughly half of the banking system is in public hands. We have small savings and loans, but we have also larger regional public banks. Um, but I wouldn't say that that they have done well in the last uh, decades. So in the uh, global financial crisis, for example, uh, many of the public banks went belly up. Um, why was that? Well. 
um, it was a combination of factors. Um, I think it was the European Union that said that public banks cannot have a, ga- a state guarantee anymore. And the state guarantee for the public banks had to be phased out, I don't know, by, by 2000, 2008 or something. So the public banks knew in the, in the early 2000s and mid 2000s that they, they could get unlimited amounts of, of money to play with, with, I don't know, share stocks and maybe CDOs or CDO squared, this kind of stuff. So, so the public banks knew that they could borrow money, um, uh, by just issuing bonds. So they, 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 they created reserves doing this. And then they invested those reserves and they bought a lot of stuff like collateralized debt obligations. So this, this is what caused the financial crisis, right? Yeah, that, that's the kind of salami products where you yeah. are supposed to get uh, payments from people who have real estate loans. And if those people did not make their payments, then you wouldn't get anything. And um, the, 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 voodoo, uh, the voodoo financial theory that was used was uh, built on the idea that the real estate market in the US is, is very regional. So they assumed that not the whole market would collapse at the same time. That never happened before historically in the US. Uh, so um, yeah, it happened then, <laughs> of course. Um, and the German banks lost a lot of money and the yeah, the, the biggest banks lost something like 25 billion, for example. I think Nord LB, which belongs to the uh, German states of uh, Hamburg and Schleswig-Holstein in the north. I, I think they lost something this big, probably 25 billion uh, euros or more. Uh, and of course, this was turned into public debt, basically. So I don't think anybody did well out of the 2008 crisis. Uh, but um, in, in the UK, we have, I think, is it five or six play- main players in the banking sector? And then basically nothing else. And it seemed like um, once those banks were gone and they became very risk averse after the crisis and they weren't lending, and that uh, generated you know, exacerbated the crisis effectively. I guess the um, when people talk about the benefits of the German banking system, what they usually discuss is the notion that you may have quite a few players in the banking sector that do really badly out of the financial crisis. And, and even, even if half your sector collapses, because it's kind of tiered, uh, so you have the smaller banks and then you have the larger regional banks. If the larger regional banks uh, collapse, then you still have the lower tier um, of banks, the smaller banks who may still issue some loans following the crash. I mean, that, that, that's how people describe it. How close to reality is that? Uh, not so close, to be honest. <laughs> so <laughs> okay. um, what, what really failed in the financial crisis, and you, you have to remember that, that Germany itself was, was affected only passively. So Germany lost a lot of exports because uh, demand collapsed in the US, but also in Spain and Ireland. Um, and for example, I think in the UK, probably house prices also went down in, during the crisis. Uh, that don't, that did not really happen in Germany. So, um, so it was a surprise to many Germans, including many German bankers and central bankers, that German banks were so involved in these uh, in these products. Um, in these, they, they bought a lot of securities from Ireland and from Spain. Um, well, with Spain, it was more like interbank market debt. Um, so, so Spanish banks borrowed heavily from German banks. And then, of course, there was uh, Dusseldorf, which was also this, this joke um, in the book, um, which was the, the big short, um, where, where Dusseldorf was buying everything in terms of financial assets. And that was one of the Landesbanken, uh, WestLB. So the, the Landesbanken are, are regional banks and the local banks, so the public Small banks are connected to the public Landesbanken, which is like a regional bank. So, so for example, if you want to invest money, you can go to your local savings and loans and they would sell you a financial product which comes from the Landesbank, which is the regional bank. So, so when the public banks on the regional level failed, of course, the, the small banks also had a, had a problem because the, the, the bigger uh, banks, the bigger public banks, they belonged to the small ones. Um, so I, I agree that it is a good idea to have local bankers. And I think it's also a good idea to have competition between public banks and private banks on the local level. Um, but I do think that the, the reason for Germany coming out of the crisis more or less unharmed is 
that uh, government spending was increased and that also the government took over to pay the wages of, of a lot of German workers, which were on, on short work. Um, so they were uh, they had reduced working hours and the government filled the gap. So I think it's rather it's Keynesian, a Keynesian policy response that was the yeah the leading cause for for this uh, for this recovery of of Germany not so much the banking structure i mean we have we have had for example uh, deutsche bank which was struggling for many years and and probably still is um it's involved still involved in almost every scandal that there is <laughs> um so yeah we have <laughs> we have a lot of banking problems in germany um it's 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 not um, something which i would want to to uh, emulate so uh, you mentioned that a lot of these changes were quite recent um coming kind of uh, decide, being decided at the european level was it was was there a time when these banks worked better you think or did they always have problems yeah i think probably in the 70s and 80s it was working better so i mean the idea of financialization and also globalization and all this this stuff um also the idea of of selling off public banks I mean, this creates a lot of competition, um, and competition competition is not good for banks. Um, it it puts them under pressure, and I think it was Chuck Prince, the the CEO of Citibank, who probably it's like fifteen years ago, said that uh, if if the music plays, you've got to get up get up and dance. So so the banks are are having problems with their with their profits. And if, if there's anything which is profitable, they just jump on it. And then you create this kind of, of movement, just like lemmings. So the first lemming <laughs> starts to move, uh, and everybody knows that it will end badly. Um, like investing in Bitcoin, for example, at some point. Um, it was, it was back then, it was mortgage backed securities and CDOs and all this kind of stuff. Uh, probably they knew that, that it was gonna, it was gonna, uh, explode at some point, but the bonus payments were there and the profits were there and stocks went up, share prices went up. Um, so, so they did what the others did uh, because they didn't want to fall behind. So, if we if we if we rethink banking, we have to think about how how to organize the the competition. It it cannot be too strong, because otherwise the banks will will just do what the other banks will do, and then you get this this kind of problem that I think John Maynard Keynes described in the beauty contest. So, so you have a guessing game. And you don't have to guess what the what's the most beautiful or who the most beautiful girl is, but you have to guess what the others are guessing. And this kind of game, uh, it's it's very far away from from the real economy. And and we should not we should not make banks play this kind of game. Yeah, you just reminded me of uh, something that um, uh, John Harvey says. Uh, uh, oh, oh no, it, it came up in the last conversation we had with John Harvey about exchange rates and you know what what drives currency prices. This idea that uh, you know nobody ever got fired for buying IBM. Yeah. Uh, so you know, it, it, even even if you know it's going to end badly, if everybody else is buying it and it's going up. You will not be blamed if you buy it and it goes down. I think he described it as it's better to be wrong in an orthodox way than to be right in an unorthodox way. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. also a Keynes <laughs> quote somewhere. Uh, it's better to fail conventionally than to succeed unconventionally. I, I always used uh, to to joke that um, that with endogenous money, we are also endogenous monkeys. So, it's, uh, <laughs> endogenous monkeys playing with endogenous money, um, and and that creates a lot of problems. Yeah, yeah, because uh, uh, these are the things that because people do when you know when, when they get a bit deeper into MMT, they get very curious about. Well, surely the external sector is having some effect and and what is that and and you know what drives exchange rates and when you talk to an academic expert or somebody in the markets who, who you know is is uh you know working with it day in day out it, it it seems to be it just people's attitudes people's expectations you know it's it's very it's very flimsy yeah Speaking of modern money, um, <laughs> there's this news story that I link to, uh, or that I will link to in the show notes, that China's launching a digital yuan and uh, or RMB. Um, now, to my mind, the yuan, if they in China have a central bank and a similar system to other fiat currencies, the yuan is already 
you know, the yuan wasn't already an entirely analog currency. So what does it even mean to say that China is launching a digital yuan? Yeah, that's a very good question. So um, the way I understand it, China changed its its currency um, system um, in the last couple of, or like in the 80s, they probably changed it. Um, so so now works like a, like a modern modern um, currency system. Um, it's it's probably very close to the euro, um, and by now the euro is also close to the to the US dollar. So it's I think it's not really hard to understand what's going on there. So the People's Bank of China um, it's it's shared by by the most high ranking politicians. So um, there's no political independence here. Um, that may be something which is different from from us, but it's it works the same way. So you have the People's Bank of China. Banks have accounts there. Um, the money that the People's Bank of China is creating, of course, is not uh, cash, but it's just reserves. So deposits at the central bank. And uh, so I agree, a digital UN, um, it just means that that people can have an account with the People's Bank of China um, before they couldn't do it. So they had to go through the intermediaries, if you want to call them that, the banking system. Um, and yeah, that is why I agree. It's um, not really something new, um, but it's um, probably turning a lot of hats because of, of Bitcoin and, and all these kind of uh, new supposed currencies. So China created paper currency, right? Oh yes, hundreds of of years ago. Um, I think they invented paper currency. Um, so yeah, they they had it long before we had it. But that is a story that that still needs to be written, I guess. So what is different? Um, forgive me, I haven't like I'm not very savvy when it comes to digital money, and I want to know what is the difference between say just look, checking my bank account on an app. Is there any difference to that? Well, I mean, the the difference is that if if you have money in your in your bank, in your commercial bank or public bank, then the bank might go bankrupt, um, and it might be a, a bit of a of a bad thing. But normally, we have deposit insurance, so as long as you don't have, I don't know, uh, two hundred fifty thousand uh, pounds in your bank account, you're you're good to go. Um, which means that the the government will jump in, and or the regulator will jump in and and save you. Um, so you won't lose anything. So if you would have your, your money directly in an account with the Bank of England, for example, there's no way that the Bank of England cannot pay. Okay, so there's, then there's really, really zero risk. Um, so you, you, are not, you, you would not be afraid of a bank run, for example, on the Bank of England because they produce that stuff. Um, but the bank run is not the problem of the modern economy. So that is why this kind of digital currency um, issued by central banks is, is not solving any real problem that we should be afraid of. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I wonder in, in that case, what's driving it? Is, it? is it just PR for China? Just, oh, look, we can play this game too? Or, you know, what, what do we think? Yeah, it's... it's I, I don't really know why they do it um, because, I mean, you can you can have um, yuan in a Chinese bank account. So then, of course, you have this risk that if the Chinese bank collapses, you might not get your money back. But um, I'm not sure whether foreigners are are allowed to to have uh, renminbi in a in an account in a Chinese bank. Probably not. Um, I mean, yeah. Normally, your banking system can be organized in a way. That the central bank says that all the deposits are insured up to maximum amount. I mean, up to whatever you lose. Um, so again, there's, there's technically there's nothing new when you have uh, central bank digital cash. Um, the the households can then have their their money in an account with the central bank, um, but that's it. So th- there's nothing else. So I don't no, I don't really understand why they are doing it. Um, probably it's kind of cool to do it. Um, and it's something new and you want to show that you are, I don't know, ahead of the West, maybe. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't add anything. I have a couple of ideas. Could it be, A, because they, ac- either they actively want to bypass banks altogether and just allow people to have bank, uh, bank accounts with the Bank of China directly. And there's a political motive behind it. Or, um, or maybe they just... Um, they want uh, to be able to monitor transactions better. Is that two potential causes for it? I mean, the biggest banks in China are public anyway. Um, I think that they still are. So some Western banks have been allowed to buy up. or They, they bought a stake in, in some of these Chinese banks. But I think that the biggest of them are, are, are public anyway. So 
since they also have the public uh, payment system, so the the People's Bank of China provides the payment system. So you, so they have all the data with all the payments, and that means it doesn't it doesn't add anything there either. If if they have the people's money also there in, in accounts at the People's Bank of China, so theoretically, yes, it, it might be an it might be easier for them to to supervise the system and to see what's what's going on and spying on people, uh, but. Uh, if they wanted to do that, they they could have done that up to now anyway. Could it be to kind of um, sorry, I'm theorizing here, but but you know, if if they get ahead of the technology when it comes to money, could they hope to maybe uh, dethrone the U.S. dollar, for example? Is this part of a kind of a, a bigger strategy here? I, I don't think that the the Chinese want to to have the the world's reserve currency because that would mean that they have would have to run current account deficits the whole time to supply the rest of the world with with renminbi but they they probably don't want to do that so they are still catching up so they are still in this industrialization game where they are now getting ahead in some of the key industries like solar panels and probably also electric cars so so the last thing that they want to have is to to uh, have a appreciation of the renminbi so that i don't know uh american cars electric vehicles are, are very cheap then in china so that the chinese consumers start buying american um and then of course the the chinese firms will will have a problem because the exchange rate is not competitive anymore um so i don't think that the chinese government is interested in in the renminbi becoming the the world currency um the reserve currency of the world um so again if to to, to supply the rest of the world with that currency they they need net imports um of course you can you can have, buy also renminbi with with euros or with pounds but that is just shifting money around so the more renminbi you buy the more pounds they will have um but why would you want to hold renminbi um there's there's no reason for it um so i i think what they are probably trying to do is they will they will and that's what's going on so in their trade with russia for example they are switching from from us dollar to renminbi and also to other currencies and and that that's that's a thing if you want so so normally for international transactions we are using us dollars all over the world um but the chinese and the russians have apparently decided not to do that anymore to to the, to the extent that they did it before so that's more of an of a news i think than than this digital currency that they are doing so the idea there is that the international transactions that China makes and the international transactions that uh, Russia makes, it basically goes through the, the People's Bank of China, right? Yeah, and then, of course, the Americans can't see anymore what's going on because they don't have the data. So if, if you're making dollar transfers, you will, you will see what's going on from the American perspective. But if you are using a foreign currency like renminbi or, or a Russian ruble, um, then of course they, the Americans have no idea who's, who's buying what for, for what kind of sum. And that of course creates, um, it creates a problem from the US perspective. Um, historically, they, they have not liked it when uh, countries decided to write invoices in, in currencies other than, than US dollars. Yeah, tell me about it. <laughs> Uh, think about Iraq, for example. Putting that to one side, and I don't mean that it's not important, but just putting that to one side, the point of of moving uh, money is to move resources, output, production between countries, right? And so, you know, for that purpose, it doesn't matter what what currency a country does that in. Does that? sound about right well i mean it depends what kind of currency you are accepting so if if russia says to the to the chinese uh, you can buy our stuff but you have to pay with ruble or with dollar and china doesn't have any rubles maybe um well they could get dollars uh, they have a lot of dollars so um it's um it's it's a real problem in in a way that that of course if you if you don't have the the currency available um you you would have to get your hands on it um, of course, you can use the the financial markets also. I mean, you can if you're the Chinese government and you need rubles, you can just go to the to the um, forex market and just exchange your your renminbi into into rubles. But that might create a, a strain maybe in the exchange rate. Um, so maybe you would have to offset that anyway at, within the People's Bank of China to to make sure that your exchange rate does not move in a way that that you you're not happy with. So. Um, if you if you're buying rubles, then of course you would depreciate the the Chinese currency. 
um, maybe from an economic policy point of view, that's that's not a good idea. So, yeah, the the picture is a little bit complicated. But since the since the Chinese are stabilizing the exchange, so they have a fixed exchange rate, so it's stabilized um, with regard to the U.S. dollar, um, more or less. So what they are doing is they are hoarding U.S. dollars. And probably when they make payments to foreigners, they probably would prefer to run down their, their U.S. dollars because it wouldn't change the, the dollar exchange rate. That's the most simple transaction for the Chinese central bank in terms of, of paying for foreign trade. Do you think that they will want to run these exports forever then? No, no, no. I don't think they will run those exports forever. Um, they, they are moving now more towards domestic demand. Um, so they, they are clearly taking steps to, to get away from this export-led growth model that they were running for, for the, those years. I mean, the China's, China's rise is based on this export model, which is relying on, well, I would say it's, it relies or it has relied on, on communist unions, which allowed the Chinese government to set nominal wages. Uh, and also the exchange rate, which was, which was, under, uh, which was depreciated or, or under, um, undervalued. Um, so, so labor was cheap in China, and companies came to China to 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 build stuff and especially to assemble stuff. And um, now they are moving up the value chain, and uh, they are losing now textile industry, for example. They are losing it to to Vietnam because that's a cheaper place now. So labor is getting more expensive in China, but that's that's a good thing. So they will rely more on domestic demand because they they understand that with the way that the global economy works. Um, I mean, China is just too big. I mean, you, you cannot become, you cannot be a net exporter if you're so big. I mean, Germany is a net exporter, and it's a hell of a problem for the eurozone. Um, so is, imagine China being an, a net exporter forever. I mean, that would create lots of, of problems in the world economy. So, so now that they're so big, uh, they they have to balance their current account. Um, it, it's, they just have to. Other, otherwise, there will be a, a, a demand drain on the, in the world economy, which is too big. And they will they will cause a recession on, in the world economy be, because of of the way that they behave, and I th I'm pretty sure that they they understand this this point. So Germany, for example, after the global financial crisis, has has not rebalanced. So Germany in Germany, net exports are still something like between I don't know five and eight percent of GDP, uh, but in China, it's down to one or two percent of of GDP. Can you just talk us through that, how that's a problem? What's the chain of events that causes a, a global uh, recession? And, and does that global recession include China as well? So they're actually shooting themselves in the foot as well. Yeah, so, I mean, unemployment is an unspent income story, as we all know. And if, if you have a trade partner in the world economy, which has lots of unspent income, so you export a lot, but you don't spend those export earnings. Okay, so you don't spend that in the world economy. That means you have a have a lack of demand, and that means you will have, well, we have significant unemployment in the world economy, and of course there, there might be deficit spenders in the world economy, like the U.S. or Wells. I don't know if Britain is a is a deficit spender in the world economy. Maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah, it is definitely. Yeah. So when you say deficit spender in the world economy, you mean uh, are they a net importer? Does that is that the right way to say it? Yeah, that's the right way to, to put it. Yeah. So, so some countries are, are deficit spending, which means they are living beyond their means if the current account goes, goes um, into, into deficit. Um, and then, of course, if the current account is in deficit, it means that, that you are losing, um, you're losing net financial wealth somewhere. Might be the government, might be the private sector. If it's the private sector, then of course you might get into problems. So households might be stressed. Um, they might be straining because they they are running out of money, uh, or their debt is increasing, which cannot go on forever. Or it's a corporate sector, and um, yeah, the way that normally the deficit spending in the private sector comes about is that you you have I don't know positive expectations, then you have some kind of real estate bubble maybe. Um, so this kind of deficit spending is is then a result uh, also of the of the unspent income by by the net exporter. So if the net exporter would spend more money, so if China and if Germany, especially G Germany and Japan now are probably the, the biggest net exporters. If Germany and, ex and Japan, if they would spend more money on imports, so if they had higher wages, for example, then of course you you don't need as much private uh, deficit spending as 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 you have right now. 
So that is something which is, is affecting the whole world economy. Is this tied in with the fears that uh, uh, some people have highlighted with regards to China holding a, a large amount of US government securities, for example? Are you saying that those fears are justified? No, 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 not at all. Um, so because they have so many dollars, they, they could afford to have higher wages in China. And if they had higher wages in China, they would buy more imports from China. And the People's Bank of China has lots of dollars. So if if you're buying stuff from Walmart, for example, from the US, uh, and ship that stuff to the to China, um, then there's there's plenty of, of uh, reserves um, which the People's Bank of China owns to to m- make those payments without um, changing the exchange rate, for example. So that is what what ha- the the Chinese have effectively done. So they have they have saved up. Uh, U.S. dollars, and they can spend them in the future, and acquire goods and services from the U.S. over time. Uh, if 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 their people want, if the if the Chinese people want them, um, is this a fair way to put it? Well, there are people out there who think that China holding uh, U.S. treasuries means that the U.S. is in debt to China to the extent that, well, how are we ever going to pay China back? And and also they think, well, China could also uh, stop lending us money and then how would we fund anything? And those concerns through an MMT lens are just not concerns at all because, you know, it, th- that's not how modern money works. Um, the real stuff that's happening on the ground that's caused China to save in dollars, that is a problem. That I think that's what you're saying, Dirk. Am I right? It's about the monetary thing and it's about the real thing. So if if China is uh, selling a lot of stuff to, to the US, it means that the US will have less employment. Okay, so of course, the US could just decide to have public deficit spending and create more employment. And then you have, I don't know, a current account deficit with China and full employment. No problem at all. Um, But because of politics, that was not what happened. Okay, so what happened was that a lot of industrial, industrial jobs were destroyed because of the Chinese imports, which were very cheap. And um, because Chinese consumers didn't have the money to to afford American goods because Chinese wages are so low, the uh, the U.S. dollars were were taken to the People's Bank of China. Well, actually, to the to the it's called Safe, the Special Administration for Foreign a Foreign Exchange, and Safe then invested those uh, those U.S. dollars, which are reserves in in Treasury bonds. So that is how they ended up with with the the. Uh, I don't know, it was up to 3,000 billion US dollars, I think, at, at one point. Um, and yeah, again, they they had lots of jobs in China. And, and that meant, of course, that they, they gave up lots of resources. Of course, if you look at the real economy, you would say, well, the US got the better deal. So they sent these little green uh, pieces of paper uh, abroad to China, and the Chinese supplied them with lots of stuff for, for Walmart and for, for other uh, consumption outlets. Um, so. That's the real story, and of course, you you could say from an MMT perspective, the the collapse in employment in some of the areas that were hardest hit in the US, because for example, computer jobs were were comp- collapsing in the two thousands. Um, you could have you could have used deficit spending by the government to create new em- jobs, public employment with nice wages, unionized, and everything. Yeah, that that would have been possible, but it wasn't done. So mm, okay. just because something is possible doesn't mean that that it is done. And then, of course, you are in the what we call in economics the second best solution. So so if you have a China um, which which um, is exporting a lot of stuff to the US, you could try to pressure China into importing more stuff from the US. So what what you're saying is that even though theoretically, according to MMD, you know these deficits are sustainable in the long term. Yep. Uh, what you're saying is that the the current situation where you have a, a, a large amount of exports from China to the US, while also having insufficient deficit spending from the US for whatever political reason, that situation is unsustainable, and and, and something will have to happen to change that. Yeah, and I mean, what what Biden is doing is he he's spending lots of money. Okay, so here's the deficit spending that you need to cure this kind of problem in the world economy. So again, it's it's a combination of of an unspent income story and a deficit spending story. So 
any any amount of unspent income you could tolerate as long as there's, there's lots of deficit spending going on to compensate for that. But that is not automatically the case. Otherwise, we would be in a new classical equilibrium world. Okay, so the world economy does not automatically adjust. So it's not that if if some country turns into an unspent income story, uh, instead of, where before it was a deficit spending story, that that then there there's another country which will drop from or fall from from an unspent income story and then turn into a deficit spender. That's that's not the case. So it, it, I mean, in in some sense, it, it must happen this kind of adjustment. Because for every current account surplus, you must have a current account deficit. But the question is, how do you get there? By increasing income or by decreasing income? And if you decrease income to, to make the balances balance, well, then the adjustment passes downwards and you are, you are creating a, a crisis and you're creating economic strain. So let's take uh, the... Uh example of say china and i don't want to be <laughs> come across as anti-chinese would just say we're just recognizing that this is a an externality because they're a, a, such a big net exporter does the the global recession that can result from that does that also hit china itself or you know, you know do they have an incentive to see it this way and and oh, yes. think about how they want to work it out well, I'm, I'm also not an anti-Chinese person, so let's talk about Germany, okay, and the Eurozone. <laughs> okay, so that's, you can insult Germany as you want. I, I, won't, I, won't, I won't be angry at you. So, um, yeah, if, if Germany, for example, is exporting lots of stuff to other Eurozone countries, as long as it does it, um, it's accumulating lots of money, okay, money paid for by Spanish consumers, Irish consumers, because they love BMWs, Mercedes-Benz, Volkswagen. So they, they're buying lots of cars and they're selling houses to each other, which they uh, pay for with borrowed money. Uh, and then they get richer because they pay higher and higher uh, prices for those houses. And because they think that they are rich now, because, I don't know, house prices in Barcelona were at the level of, of those of Hamburg, for example, but wages were around one third. Um, they they started buying lots of German stuff, um, and yeah. Then in the end, the um, the whole the whole demand which came from from Ireland and also from Spain it was created by those real estate bubbles, by the increase in household and corporate debt. And of course, Germany is a big exporter, so around forty percent of of the production of Germany is exported. Okay, so if if your exporting markets collapse because I don't know Spain and Ireland go into a crisis. Then where are the German companies selling their exports to? Um, so there's a big problem, and this is why in Germany GDP in 2009 collapsed by by it was I think six percent or five point something, which was one of the biggest numbers in the whole eurozone, and and that is the problem of of running this kind of export led growth uh, system. If you are a small country, then you can be more or less sure that you will not distort the the economy. But if you are a big country, um, you will distort the economy. Okay, so because Germany is so successful, it it drains net financial savings from Spain and from Ireland, and of course it's the net financial wealth of households and corporations in Ireland and Spain goes down over time. And after I don't know maybe ten years, they get into trouble. Now we're talking about Jaime Minsky, so they have cash commitments because it was. In, during the optimistic times, during the bubble, they, they borrow lots of money and they have to repay that money. And they have those cash commitments and now there's, there's not enough money around. So there's not enough income in your economy um, to, to validate those investments, to make those payments. And then the whole, the whole financial structure of the economy collapses. Um, and then Germany is, is damaged uh, as well because, because they can't export and that creates unemployment in Germany. And, and this is how the connection is also with China. So again, um, we talked about China now, but but right now the bigger problems are, are Japan and especially Germany. That's what we should talk about in terms of, of having a problem of unspent income in the world economy. So to, to continue to draw parallels between uh, China and Germany, um, are both in this position because they're not spending enough money uh, and um, are, are Chinese uh, motivations for not spending uh, money the same as the german motivations for not spending money 
Yeah, it's a little bit different. Um, that's a very good question. So, so in Germany, we had um, a red-green government which came to power in '98, which was one year before the euro was was fixed with the exchange rate and everything. Um, so they they said their economic analysis, and this is like the Blairite camp of of labor, so new labor. They said we need to be more competitive, which means we have some kind of uh, compact with the unions and we agree now that we let wages grow only 1% and we know that our productivity grows at 2%, which means that unit labor costs will come down. If you do this, then of course the imports that Germans are buying, they will not rise as before because now the wage growth is slower. And the Germans still go to the supermarket, they still buy stuff, but the wage growth is now lower. And that means the exports of, of other countries like Spain and Ireland and so on, Italy, those exports are now not, they're not growing as fast as before. At the same time, they have this kind of credit bubble. And also, as Warren pointed out, the, the Spanish government uh, decided to increase public wages by, by quite a lot in the late 90s and also early 2000s. Um, apparently, because they, they had lower interest rates to pay <laughs> because they now had the euro. Um, so they said, okay, if we have more money, we can spend it on public employees. Okay, so that's the German story. So the German story is one of wage suppression. Okay, so you have you have a political agreement that you want to have slower wage growth, and that means that again, exports are exports are still growing because they depend on foreigners' income, and you you can change that. So imports are not growing as much because you you just decided to reduce incomes. In in China, it's it's more of an exchange rate story. So the the euro is, of course, it's a flexible currency. Um, inside the eurozone, of course, it's not. But the Chinese decided to fix their currency against the dollar. So it was for a long time, it was eight renminbi something to, to the dollar, roughly. Um, and th- that was undervalued. So that w- that meant that, I don't know, an hour of Chinese labor costs like something like 50 cent US. Given the productivity that China had, that was still a very good deal. I mean, you have to look at unit labor costs, really. That is what matters. Um, so you could, you could, yeah, you could hire a lot of Chinese workers for a very low price and their productivity was halfway decent. So, so you got a good deal if you were a company and you employed these workers. And why did China do that? Um, well, China understood that with, with free trade, um, they will not stand a chance. I mean, in, in free trade, the biggest companies will win the market. Um, and that is also what Germany exploited. So if, if you are a German car manufacturer like Volkswagen and you build, I don't know, a million cars and, and more, um, your, your, your costs will be very sm- small, your average costs, because you have a very big factory with lots of, of machinery, lots of robots. Um, so you will win uh, the competition. And, and China knew that they will not win the competition because their domestic companies are too small. So they said to companies like Volkswagen, you cannot sell to China. If, if you want to sell to China, you have to pay a 70% tariff on, on a car. But you can build Chinese factories and produce Volkswagen in, a, in our own country, which will be cheap, so you will have high profits. So China, of course, they had, a, they had a potentially huge market, but they didn't have the technology. So I'm now talking about the 90s, basically. Um, so they, they lured companies like Volkswagen into China, offering cheap labor and a huge market. And also, of course, the expectation of, of maybe this is once at one point the, the biggest market in the world, which probably by now it, it is. And now in, in 2021, uh, Volkswagen will produce more cars in China than in Western Europe. Um, and that is, that is an economic development strategy that the Chinese government uh, did. And that is why they turned into net exporter, because they, they needed the, the technology. Uh, and the net exports, um, that's just a, um, a result of that strategy, but that's not what they wanted to do. Okay. So they, they wanted to have the technology and the high productivity and the, the well paid jobs in the industrial sector. And, and they got that and they have very, very happy with that. And yes, they had to give up part of their production, uh, for, for green pieces of paper. So they exported to the US and got in return green pieces of paper, which they did not spend on consumption goods. So yes. In, in terms of the real economy, um, you, are, you are losing, um, but you're also winning the, the dynamic game because productivity inside your country is going up. And that means that you can, with the same amount of resources, you can produce more stuff. And that's what, what the economy is, is also about. I mean, Adam Smith in his Wealth of Nations said that the wealth of a nation is, is consumption and it's consumption by, by all people. 
and and China was able to increase consumption by all people through this kind of development uh, strategy by by export that grows. Yeah. So in the EU, obviously there is a a single currency that means Germany's currency is pegged against other European currencies, which is just basically the euro <laughs> everywhere. But uh, what role does the the kind of the Chinese peg against the dollar um, play in all this? Is is China uh, selling dollars in order to to maintain this peg well it's, it's very easy so I'm, I'm talking now about 20 years back roughly okay um mm -hmm. they probably have liberalized a bit so 20 years ago the the chinese companies and also chinese people were not allowed to hold us dollars they're not they were not allowed to hold euros either so if you were a chinese exporting company you you exported to to the us I think one third of the stuff that China exported went to Walmart at some point. Okay, so it's really a Walmart story. So chi Chinese producers export stuff to to the uh, to the US. Walmart is paying them with US dollars. Of course, these are reserves in an account in an American bank where some kind of Chinese company has has an account, and then the Chinese company is forced to to surrender these US dollars. So they they are forced to swap those US dollars against renminbi at the People's Bank of China. So now the People's Bank of China has the reserves and the exporting company has uh, renminbi. That's how you fix the exchange rate. So you are forced to sell dollars and there's only one um, there's only one institution which you can sell them to which was the the People's Bank of China. Um and they they set the price. And there was no question about whether this price was was correct or not i mean you could try to go to the black market but they probably punished you quite quite harshly if you if you did so that's how you fix an exchange rate you just let the central bank handle all the transactions uh, in both ways so selling and buying us dollars uh, against renminbi and and into renminbi Right. So basically what they said is you can't hold dollars. And by the way, this is what we're giving you for them. Yes. And of course, they had a closed capital account. So you could not say, OK, if you if you want my dollars, wait a sec. Uh, let me just um, let me just invest them into, I don't know, Google stocks or some, something like this. So they had a closed capital account. So there was no way to nowhere to go for, for Chinese companies. Well, there were, of course, illegal, illegal um ways out of this problem so you could still try to get somebody to invest your money and and i don't know fake the accounts or something i mean that that was going on probably but i think that they they were pretty effective with the capital controls there okay so through the mmt lens exports are a cost in real terms to the exporting country and imports are a real uh, gain in real terms to the importing country but we, we were adding this extra layer of well if the uh, importing country doesn't have a job guarantee in place or doesn't understand its responsibility to uh, turn around that unspent income story and increase its deficit it turns into a recession which eventually if unchecked will just affect the whole global economy so i think that's what we've just said but then there was this other thing that i hadn't considered before that the exchange wasn't just okay we'll get green pieces of paper and you'll get the stuff america it was actually at the, our long game was we want the technology yes we're happy to take the hit we'll give you the cheap labor but really the real exchange was let's have the technology Yeah, and it was very smart because, look, what they could have done instead is to create public companies, then borrow US dollars from international banks, and then import machinery from Europe, from the United States, and then create those public companies uh, and let them work to to produce goods for export. Um, that is also a possibility to to develop your country, to, to create industry. I'm not saying that it is not a good idea, but... Um, it is probably a better idea to uh, to have a foreign company like Volkswagen jump into China. They bring their foreign direct investment, which means they they bring the machines, they bring the money, whatever they need to to create those factories, and then they start producing. So there's no financial ri risk with this kind of story. Okay, so the financial risk is all Volkswagens. If something goes wrong, and in China you cannot produce Volkswagen of a of a good quality, so they won't be sold. There's no financial risk to any public company or to the state. So it's not that then the Chinese government uh, has to repay some some dollars and they can't 
they can do it because they were not able to to create good cars. Um, so the risk again is is all Volkswagens, and that is why this kind of strategy is is a good idea. Um, even though I I admit that of course on the real side you are giving something up. So you attract foreign companies, they exploit your workers in a way. Um, so because you you don't pay a fair wage, you pay less. But the workers are happy because they have better employment than before. Okay, so you you come from you had in the 1990s hundred, hundreds of millions of Chinese people working in the west of China in the agricultural sector and marginal productivity. If I, I'm allowed to use this concept, so so or even the average productivity, let's say the average productivity in the agricultural sector was very close to zero. Okay, so so, so everything was very crowded and the fields were small. Probably it would have been better to have less people in the west of China. Uh, but what do you do with those people? Um, and then they had this idea, how about we put those people into factories in the east, on the east coast of China and let them work for exporting companies? Um, and then we build cities um, so that they have a home to live in. And, and that's in, in very short term the Chinese development strategy, which is perfectly compatible with, with MMT. So w- one of the uh, um, uh, traps that uh, Fidel mentions uh, when he talks about developing economies is uh, the foreign direct investment trap. And and it, I, I guess it sounds a bit similar to what you've just said in the sense of, you know, you, you fight over to, to, to attract this, this, this foreign investment and the, to pull in these companies. And, but he mentions that the main issue is that these companies, they leave just as quickly as they came. But I guess China has gotten around that problem, right? Would you say that's that's a result of the capital controls, or is there something else they've done? You know, there's there's 1.3 billion reasons for for companies not to leave China, which is the Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so why would you want to leave the largest market in the world? <laughs> okay, um, so that is something which China can offer and other countries cannot. So I'm I'm absolutely in agreement with with Fidel. The problem is that most industries are very footloose. Okay, textile industries they now move to Vietnam. They pay shitty wages. Um, probably some some factories collapse because they they don't want to spend any money. That's a big problem, okay? So your your people get exploited and then you don't move on. Um, so it's only worth the ride if you want. Um, that if you if you can move up from textiles then to other industries, and and again China is offering this really really large market. And Volkswagen, for example, as I said, most of their profits probably come from China. Okay, it's probably higher than than profits in Europe or, or the US or Latin America. So why would would Volkswagen leave uh, China? They they would never want to do that. Um, but that is, I mean, this is why you cannot replicate China. I mean, India can try if 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 they w- would would want to do that. Um, but most developing countries, um, they are either too small or they are small in the sense that transport costs are very high, and that means that that the economy is very fractured. Okay, so it takes forever to to go from one side of the country to the other side. So if you if you want to build a big factory somewhere in the middle and then sell your products all over the country, then the prices will be very high because transport costs in, inside the country are are very high. So so China has fixed this. Also, they they have a very nice high speed train network by now, much better than than we have in Western Europe, I guess. Um, so yeah, you you have to you have to create the the public institutions that support development if if you want and and china has this this big advantage of being the biggest market in the world so yeah that's that's why the companies are happy to stay there in china just while we're talking about fidel and uh monetary sovereignty i guess his work on monetary sovereignty another trap that um uh, fidel talks about um developing economies get into is that if they're exporting low value added output, um, which I guess is not China's story. No, no, China is exporting industrial products. So, so the business model always has been to to move into industrial production, and it's really replicating uh, Germany and Japan and South Korea. It, it's always the same story. I mean, this is how. I mean, England was the first one to industrialize, and everybody else was a latecomer, and it was always the same in free trade. The English were better because they had bigger factories, and that meant they had lower costs. Um, so, so you needed tariffs to cut off your own market, your domestic market, from the world market, and then you you somehow needed to to 
to get a get a hand on those technologies. Um, I have to admit, because I read that somewhere, that Germans stole a lot of stuff in terms of technology from the British. Okay, they <laughs> they looked at their steamships and they copied the designs, and they just—I mean, it's just like Chinese car makers now copying uh, German cars, for example. So it's always the same kind of thing. It's just patents, though, isn't it? I mean, uh, I, I wish we were sharing more of those uh, patents of, on vaccines and with the developing world. You know how, how capitalist Western firms are, uh, are itchy when it comes to trademarks and, and patents and all these kind <laughs> yeah. of things. So they, they don't like to share this. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, this is the kind of, I mean, development means you, you copy from, from the other countries and um, you, you try to, to, to make sure that your market is disconnected from the world market because otherwise you, you will not be able to grow your own firms into bigger firms. And um, this is why free trade is not for everybody. I mean, that's, that's something which is probably also not, not appreciated in the economics discipline, but um, almost every story of development, of industrial development, is a story of, of trying to, yeah, to compete on a, on a world market level. And normally the way you do it is you, you put tariffs on, on a lot of products and then you grow your own domestic industries by, by copying what, what the other countries are doing. Um, and yeah, that's, that's what China did, but that's also what Germany did in the, in the late 19th century, for example. So, so uh, can we contrast that with a, a, a developing economy that, that fell into the trap of low value added exports? Yeah, we can talk about Brazil or Argentina, for example. I mean, Argentina is in this kind of trap because they have this big beef sector. So it's, it's all agricultural products and, um, there's, there's not much, much else. Uh, Brazil, for example, they had an industrialization drive in the fifties and sixties. I think that also even earlier, probably that that happened. I mean, I mean, I think there was also Fortlandia, which was, um, the idea of, of creating a Ford plant for the, Ford Motor Company. Um, so the Fortlandia was somewhere in the Amazon Bazin. So they, they had this wild idea of building cars in the jungle. <laughs> uh, it all collapsed, by the way. But they, they, they managed to create some industry in Brazil, for example, um, aeroplanes from Embraer. Uh, they are still producing them. So, so Brazil had, was successful in, in uh, starting their, their industrialization, where other countries were probably not so much uh, successful. I think Argentina probably never really tried. Um, they, they had too many good agricultural products to, to sell. Uh, about Peru, I'm not so sure. Uh, I think that they also do more like agricultural stuff, but mining industries is the biggest. Well, I think at the moment they they go through. They seem to go through seasons. They they had a uh, during the 70s. It was about guano and and you know and, and natural fertilizer, and and then they moved into well agriculture. But then at the moment is it was the big kind of gold boom that that made that grew the exports and, and took Peru out of a lot foreign debt at the time. But the issue is that it's completely extractive, you know, it's, you're not, you, you, they're paying a heavy price in terms of environmental costs as a result of the mining industry. But also, I don't think, you know, they've, they've used that income, say, uh, as a means to develop other industries. They, they've, they've done very little. Yeah, I was I was visiting Peru like ten years ago almost, um, and it was it was also they they had a good bus system so that the the country was connected in terms of of using buses modern buses to travel long distances, um, but with the mountains and everything um, and and the way that the country is shaped uh, with a lot of deserts uh, at the sea for example. Um, it's, it is difficult to, to have an, to have some kind of economic geography that fits to the, to the variety of Peru, which is very diverse. So, uh, they have, they have many different climate zones and it's, it's a very diverse country, probably also in terms of, of people. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it would probably be, be too much to ask for, for a development strategy to, to create this kind of industrial drive right now but yeah it's it's nevertheless one one should try it just one thing to mention on that you know the uh, food that they take um on nasa on, on astronauts mm -hmm. that was based on um uh, agricultural you know means of treating uh potatoes and and food that peruvians had developed centuries ago about you know freeze drying uh foods um so i think what we didn't do is patent that 
so <laughs> that now we could, you know, be reaping some some money. Yeah. But do you really think, you know, that the imperial powers in the world would respect those <laughs> patents anyway? Let's face it. Yeah. No. <laughs> So just to circle back to where we started, which is this uh, uh, Chinese digital currency, what is the takeaway? It, it, it's really just a technological change that uh, China have come up with of, of the way they move money around. And it, it's not, like you said, Dirk, they're not really in the position where they want to suddenly become a net importer. So it won't change a lot. Um, Americans, but also non-Americans get really scared when they f feel that the dollar's uh, seat at the top of the hierarchy of uh, reserve currencies is, is being challenged. What is the problem? If there are fewer exchanges done in US dollars globally, what is the problem? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, I think probably that has a lot to do with, with myth. Um, probably... Um, the American political elite probably believes that, that everybody should use dollars to make payments. And that ensures that there is always a lot of demand for U.S. dollars, which means that the, the Americans can always buy stuff from the rest of the world for U.S. dollars, which is this exorbitant privilege. Um, so I think that may, may have something to do with it. Um, because, yeah, I mean, with MMT, you understand that, that, I mean, Demand for your currency normally ends at the at the frontier at the at the border, um, because foreigners don't need your currency. So there will not be any demand for your currency once you cross into into the next country. If you want to have a strong currency, which means you you can buy a lot of stuff for for, for the little pieces of paper you have, you you would need to create a lot of demand for your currency. And if people need your currency to make payments, well, that's that's very good. So that means that your exchange rate is, is higher than it would be otherwise. And um, to, to get uh, those dollars, the, the foreigners will have to sell you something, um, assets or goods, services, or they, they have to take out a loan. And yeah, now we're talking about the, the hierarchy of, of money, basically on the, the pyramid of money on the international level. But every other currency in the world is not the reserve currency, right? And in all those other countries, they import, they export, they have a high standard of living. Lots of countries that aren't the USA actually have a higher standard of living than the USA. So that exorbitant privilege thing is, it's a nice story, but you know, in reality, to the American in the street, the average American in the street, not to mention the the people that are kind of you know been marginalized by the way America does things, <laughs> um, it doesn't really make any difference to them as I see it. No, that's that's true. I mean, you have around seven hard currencies. Um, so you have also the Swiss franc, you have the UK pound, the European euro, the Japanese yen. You have now also the renminbi. You have the currencies from New Zealand, Canada, Australia. I mean, these are all very hard currencies, and I'm pretty sure that all those countries can buy imports using their own currencies. So I'm, I would not say that having the world's reserve currency means that you have an exorbitant privilege, which other countries do not have. Um, but I think the main, the main point is that, I don't know, 70% probably of the world's payments are in US dollars, something like this. But that means also that you will see a lot of those payments. So in terms of understanding what's going on in the global economy, you have a much better view if if you are an American and you are you have access to to the data from from all these payments. Um, so probably this is more about power in terms of also intelligence. So you you are able to get information. So you know which kind of exporting company from China is paying which kind of other supplier. So so if you want to know. Um, so that would be available for, at least for the secret service if if you need it. Information is power. Yeah, and then we are talking about power in the global economy and uh, about yeah using also secret data to um, to have your companies win the in the in the competitive struggle on the world market, for example. And we all know that industrial uh, industrial espionage and these kind of issues say they, they do happen. I mean, especially with the IT stuff that we have seen seeing now that, that people are trying to hack into computers of others and trying to shut down the production somewhere else remotely. 
this kind of stuff. So that has nothing to do with with money itself, but it's more of it has something to do with with power and industrial stru- industrial structures and and capitalism as as a political game. It would give America an edge in basically all negotiations, right? Yeah. The reason I bring it up is because. Yeah, it, it sounds like it, it is a great position. If you were uh, running a nation, you would want to be moving your your nation's currency closer to the top of that pyramid of uh, currencies. I just think it's worth you know pointing out. It doesn't mean it's it's the end of the world for every other currency <laughs> to not be at the top of that pyramid. And in fact, the 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 countries that issue other currencies are, actually seem to have a better time of it than. Uh, than uh, a lot of Americans. Yeah, yeah, Christian, I I agree that that's a very good point. So so some people think that that because it's a pyramid that you need to be on top. <laughs> uh, but that's very, that's a very Western idea, I guess. We are confused by those symbols, and if something goes up, then we think, oh yeah, well, okay, that means we have to go there up. Um, so let's be number <laughs> one. Um, but of course, you are right. I mean, this is also what I what I talked about when when I talked about China. Um, China started with a currency that was in the 80s and 90s. It was a, it was a, a little, little little currency. They didn't have a lot of power. Um, they 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 don't have a lot of power in terms of military power. Um, they didn't have a lot of trade power. But but China, nevertheless, they I mean their their development over the last 20 years. They they pulled hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, and they they pulled them right into the 21st century. Okay, so they have now universities where they have I don't know millions of students, uh, probably tens of millions of students by now. Um, so so in terms of what they achieved in terms of of development for for their people, this is really extremely uh, interesting. And they did not achieve that because they they tried to imitate the Bundesbank or something. So they don't, did not say, let's have a hard currency like those Germans. We call it the Chinese mark. Okay, that's that was not the strategy. So there's no there's no need to move up to the to the top of these of this kind of pyramid if you want to develop your country. And and this is why I, I think it was a very good comment, Kristen, that you mentioned that 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 many people seem to believe that not having a hard currency which is on the top of this pyramid means that you cannot develop. I, I think that's that's too simple. As I said, China has this really big market, so China is a special case. For other countries, well, what what is it that they can offer? I mean, Chile, for example, in South America, they they export a lot of copper, or Venezuela used to export a lot of oil. So it's a combination of real factors and monetary factors. But it's yeah, it's more complicated than saying uh, countries don't develop because they're not on top of the pyramid of of monies on the international arena. So, um, do you think that? China then understands the economy in the way that MMT is understand the economy, um, and that they've they've used this knowledge to develop this particular strategy. And also, um, you know, aligned to that question is that uh, China is is quite careful about uh, Western ideas not kind of dominating their culture. But I do know that a lot of international students are from China. Presumably, they they study things like finance, and 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 they have an interest in understanding how Western finance and economics work. Is there a risk that they may take some kind of Western economic ideas that may actually be detrimental to China? <laughs> yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so I've I've been to China twice about ten years ago. Um, I've also been teaching at Shanghai University. Um, and it, it was, yeah, the, the Chinese students are, are very eager to learn from us. Um, I mean, they're very, but it's more like, so it's not like they, they look up to us and they think like we want to be like them, but it's like they, they're curious what we are doing because, because they are Chinese and there's lots of them and they think, okay, so you are coming from this very small country, which is called Germany in West Europe. Um, so let's see what you have to say. Um, so it's it's kind of nice because they they are kind of interested in, in what we're doing. Um, but you are right; they are they are Chinese. I mean they they don't have this exposure to Western ideas. They 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 probably are trying to to bring in some of these elements that we have, but it's probably more the technical stuff. So I don't think that China will will turn into a Western country in terms of of culture. Um, at least it's not it's not trying to go that way. Um, it tries. It tries to go with the Chinese way. But if you look at 
Chinese students and and what they are watching in terms of Netflix, for example, um, then you will see that that they are exposed to the Western stuff that we also consume. Um, so I believe that the the Chinese will be much more Western in in 2050 than than they have been in, for example, 2010. Um, there will be a big difference because the country has opened up. And it's, I think the Chinese know that that they don't have to become Westerners, and that's not what they want. Um, but they they just pick what they what they like, just like like everybody else. And and because I mean, I mean, if if you watch, for example, Chinese movies, they they are very good. Um, I, I watched some of them, and it's I thought maybe it's difficult to connect to them, but I, I understood perfectly what the emotions were and and what kind of of. What kind of problem there was in terms of of social tragedy or or whatever the the movie was about um so in terms of economics they they are importing the textbooks and the international economics classes and the macroeconomics by Blanchard no, don't. um and yeah that is that might turn into a problem, but they have been very keen how can we warn them? We need to warn them nah, they know <laughs> I think they know, so they are very pragmatic. And I think that, I mean, the Chinese know because of the Marxist tradition and, and the fact that they are still a communist country officially, they know that there's a big gap between what, what you say and what you do. <laughs> we have the long-awaited second European MMT conference coming up in September. So tell us what we know so far about what's going to happen there. Yeah, well, we are, we are very eager to have a conference which is also in person, uh, but also online. So it will take place on September 13 to 15 this year. Um, we start on a Monday, the 13th, um, and it will be hosted by the JFK Institute of Free University Berlin. And we have uh, four keynote speakers. So Warren Mosler, we have Ala Semenova from SUNY Potsdam, Stravka Todorova from Wright State University, and we have Randall Ray from the Levy Institute. And um, the call for papers is out now. So if you check our website, mmtconference.eu, I repeat, mmtconference.eu, uh, you will find there the call for papers. And um, there will be presentations on the third day, which are all online. So if you are not in, in uh, close to Berlin or if you're, if you're very far away, um, you can still present. So we, we try to do all the presentations with Zoom. And then on the second day, we also have some, some panels. So we have a couple of, of subjects which we want to talk about. The pe first panel is on unions and demand policy. Um, so the second panel is on inequality. Third panel on the Green New Deal, by the way, with Fadel Kaboub, also talking about the Green New Deal from the perspective of the South. And then the last panel, which is probably the very interesting panel, political economy of fiscal policy. Okay, and this inside the Eurozone and in Berlin with Warren Mosler and others. In the political economy of fiscal policy uh, panel, we will discuss the, the problems of the Eurozone. So apparently the German government has asked the Spanish government uh, this month to um, cut down government spending. So they, they should prepare to um, have an economy which fits into the Eurozone's rules, which is the Stability and Growth Pact straitjacket. Um, so that has, of course, created some tension. Um, the Next Generation EU program is is not done yet in a way. So it's um, it's very close to to being completed. Um, and of course, there's a grant part so that uh, countries like Italy and Spain just get a couple of billions to, to spend, which is not very large. It's about 1% of GDP per year. And there, there was also supposed to be a loan part so that those countries could borrow money from, from the EU. Um, but apparently no country has applied for those, for those loans, which means if we compare the Eurozone's response to the American response, we, we see that we don't have austerity yet in the in the eurozone, but we don't have uh, an expansionary fiscal policy um, that is that is needed to to get out of the crisis probably. Um, so we will have to talk about why we don't have that. So what are the players inside the German political arena, for example, that uh, that stop um, the eurozone from becoming more expansionary? Um, what what are the po political positions of the parties, for example, with respect to this? Um, for example, the Green Party has said that they want to increase government spending, uh, also to to create something like a, the Green New Deal. So they would want to abolish the, the German debt break, which is enshrined in the constitution. So yeah, we will talk about about the elections of Germany also. So um, the conference date um, 
is um, September 13 to 15. And I think about one and a half weeks later, we have uh, national elections in Germany. So, so all these issues are very interesting. And it seems like we will have political change in Germany. So the, the grand coalition that we have now, Christian Democrats and Social Democrats, they, they, uh, their votes combined will not be half of the votes. So it's very likely that we will have a new government new new parties coming in so yeah that's that's what we need to talk about and uh, i forgot to mention that um we also have a title for the conference which is economic policy in a post-pandemic world so we are optimistic uh and i can tell you from right from berlin that we had one million something vaccin- vaccinations uh yesterday so so now it seems like we we will get there uh we will get into the post-pandemic world uh until september I had a great time at at the Berlin conference uh, two years ago, and I'm sure this one will be even better than the last. So really looking forward to it. You can count me in. Great to hear that. It's a great place to leave it. Yeah. Just rubbing it in my face that I couldn't go. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> that is a great place to leave it. Thanks for all of your fantastic insights, Dirk. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. I'm already looking forward to next time. Yeah, thanks to talk to you, Christian, and to you, Patricia. It's it's always nice to talk to you. That was the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Don't forget... You can support the show through Patreon, starting at a dollar a month, and get access to patron-only episodes. You can do that by going to patreon.com slash mmtpodcast. You can also find me on Twitter at mmtpodcast, and you can find Patricia on Twitter at Patricia N. Pino. And you can email us at mmtpodcast at outlook.com. Thanks for listening, and we hope to hear from you.